Hey guys, and welcome to another installment of my top 20 countdown of my top 20 all-time favorite sequences from the TV show Lost in Space. We're now up to number 13 on the countdown, and 13, number 13 belongs to a, another beloved morality play. I think one of the most well-written morality plays in the series. Number 13 belongs to a sequence in this episode from the first season, Wish Upon a Star. Written by Barney Slater and directed by Sutton Rowley. Now, in this episode, um, Dr. Smith um, and Will, I think, um, discover a crashed uh, aircraft or the remnants of one with a special device that all you have to do is place it on your head, hold the base in your hands, and wish for whatever you want, and uh, the device will produce it. A little bit like the replicators from um, Star Trek, particularly the Next Generation and those shows. Um, so, uh, this is a morality play, um, the whole family, uh, learns of it, and begins to, uh, use it, and they're supposed to take turns. Now, um, now, uh, there are two sequences that, um, go together kind of because they are so well written. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it almost has, because, okay, what, what John Robinson, um, I'll show it, okay. What John Robinson says to her daughter Penny is reflective of Mike Brady speaking to his kids, okay, so, you could, I mean, the logic and the message that John bring, uh, presents to his kids, uh, particularly uh, Penny, reminds me of Mike Brady, of the Brady Bunch, and what uh, he uh, message he brings to his family. So, we're going to start with that segment. Okay, before I play this, I just want to remind you that <coughs> the people who have uploaded these episodes have altered the speed of the episode to either speed it up or slow it down. Uh, so not to get in any copyright trouble. Well, the person who uploaded this sped it down, uh, slowed it down really a lot. So please forgive that. This is slowed down quite a lot. Um, now, this is so well written. This is typical brother-sister competition. Typical brother sister fighting in the uh, um, um, dynamic of siblings, and uh, but you'll this starts it off.
Apparently, it could only be used a certain number of times per day. And by the way, before I continue, a family conference or a family meeting, ever since I saw this, I said to myself, oh, I love this. I never grew up with it. We, I grew up never having a family uh, conference or meeting at all. I was so envious of the Robinsons at this point. I wish I had John Robinson as a father and the kind of family that he has here, including uh, Do uh, Major West. I just, I just love this show, and I love this concept of having a family meeting. And it was because of this that I said to myself, in my future family, 
I want there to be a family meeting once every week. Set aside in the family calendar one time, unless in a situation like this, where we have an emergency meeting, what would, or an unscheduled meeting, okay? This is more or less an unscheduled. Not emergency, but unscheduled. But I love the idea. I absolutely love the concept of having a family conference or a family meeting. And it's, I, I credit this episode for giving me that idea. I just love the idea. And I wish I had it. But, damn it, I'm, if I get a family, if I have a family of my own, that will be mandatory in my family. That once a week, we sit down and we have a family uh, meeting or conference. I suppose you've uh, put the new request in a chariot. Well, I... It was my fault. I asked John to take me for a walk. You were supposed to be working in the hydroponic garden. And what? Weren't you supposed to be helping Dad? Well, does anyone care to make a comment? Then I will. And it can be summed up in three words. The thought machine. Well, I guess maybe we've all been relying on it too much, John. But why work when the machine can do it for you? Well, up to now, this family's been getting along very well. Respect and love for one another. And you cannot wish for those things with that. Now we get this machine that makes dreams come true. And instead of making us happy, it sows the seeds of discontent, mistrust, and indolence. I said a machine that makes dreams come true. Nightmares can also be dreams. I'm afraid your services will be severely compelled, my careful friend. The thought machine has made you obsolete. Obsolete, old-fashioned, outmoded, no longer in fashion. Exactly. However, you may still be utilized as a menial or a servant, perhaps. Ah, Professor Robinson. You have the thought machine if there's something you want. Definitely is. And what is that? I want you to get rid of it. Are you suggesting that I destroy our Garden of Eden? Well, if you don't, I will. You do no such thing. I won't allow it. I don't think you have any choice, Dr. Smith. This machine is mine. You have no right to harm it. I do when it endangers our welfare. Very well, then. Then I'll take it away. I'll go back to the old derelict. Well, of course, it's your privilege. I'll leave it for me. And if you don't mind, I'll take the robot with me as a servant companion. Your precious machine can supply all the companionship you need. The robot stays here. Okay, 
Now, I think that was one of the greatest sequences in the show. Okay. And just like Gene Roddenberry of Star Trek fame, who only wanted to showcase the complexities of the human condition um, in all its forms, so did Lost in Space in its own way. Nothing displays it or showcases it like this sequence. This really is number 13. What I've shown you so far is a bonus sequence um, it's almost like 13A, and this is, uh, or, or pre-13, I guess, or, yeah, 13A, <laughs> and this is 13B, um, because this, um, is really what makes this episode so extraordinary. Who needs men? I can get along by myself. Refusing to give me the rope I will need. I can get along without him too. Hmm. I have a thought machine. And I can have anything I want. All I have to do is think, then, boom, <laughs> it's mine.
Dr. Smith hides the machine, runs back to the camp, and then asks the family for help. And so John, knowing what happened, um, as telling uh, Dr. Smith to get the machine because that's what the alien wanted. Let's turn back before it's too late. We're getting the machine. The machine is in there. We'll get it. Here it is. I know. Uh, Given the matter some additional thought, I've decided to keep the machine in my possession after all. Uh, one of these days soon we'll be returning to Earth, and this machine is going back to the derelict spaceship where the alien can find it. Thank you, man. 
I just want to make a comment here. <clears throat> Notice how inoffensive the alien is. He is standing pleading for the machine back. He's not being aggressive. He's not fighting for the machine. He is asking for the machine back. He is standing there saying, you choose to give me my machine back. It's your choice. I will not fight you to get it back. I will not attack you. I will not kill you. I will stand there and plead for the machine back. Whether you give me my machine back is your choice of your free will. And that is something that whoa went over my head as a kid. But now after seeing this episode and talking with you about it, this is what I see from this scene. Okay. He the alien chases Dr. Smith because he wants his machine back. But he doesn't attack the family. He doesn't even attack Dr. Smith. He is standing there with his arms out, with his hands out, pleading for Dr. Smith to do the right thing. <coughs> and that's why I think this is one of the most well-written and well-produced episodes. One of the most underrated episodes, but as real morality play on so many levels and it continues with the final statement <coughs> but I just want to make a, uh, a statement that once Dr. Smith handed the machine back to the alien of his own free will the alien was happy so the alien was really a good guy, okay? He was a good guy. He had a machine that gave people what they wanted up to a point. And we will see that here. He's happy now. He's got his machine back. He didn't harm me. He didn't harm me. Of course not. He had no ill will toward him. Why did the alien give us things 
and then decide to take them back. Does Dr. Smith ask for too much? You know, he could have had anything he wanted. But like most people, it wasn't enough. He wanted more. When he tried to create a slave, he only realized this. He would have stayed, Doctor. We made him leave because we were selfish. <laughs> And uh, that's it for now. Uh, this was a very complex episode and uh, required uh, its own video. Okay. Um, because there was so much in it. And like I said, uh, Wish Upon a Star, the 11th episode of the first season, is one of the most underrated episodes of the series and I think most forgotten probably many people thought it was kind of a sleeper episode not me not me I think this is one of the greatest episodes uh, and this is why this is in my top 20 um, and as high as number 13 uh, because of the morality play how well written the story is uh, how well produced the story is. Um, it, it, I think this is one of the greatest morality plays from Lost in Space. And one that will always have a special place in my heart. Uh, and the way I look at the world and human behavior. From a psychological and sociological uh, perspective. Okay, guys, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I'll see you next time when my countdown continues. Take care, guys. See you soon. Bye.